But anyway, uh, this work that I'm going to present today is about production risk, farmer welfare, and BT corn in the Philippines. This is joint work with San, San T. San Lestawai, who's uh, my graduate student, and Dr. Chico Yorobe at uh, UPLP. So Dr. Yorobe is here, so if you have any questions, ask him. <laughs> okay, what I want to cover today is first just a brief introduction of where the literature is on risk in BT corn, and then discuss some of the conceptual the concepts needed to sort of understand uh, evaluation of the risk impacts of BT corn. So we're going to talk about such concepts as risk premiums, uncertainty equivalents, stochastic production functions, where we have two specifications, the default coverage of us, and an extended SAHA model. I'm going to discuss some of the data and estimation procedures, some of the results, and provided with some major conclusions and some plans for future work. BT crops, both corn and cotton, are now one of the most widely adopted GM crops in the world. Single trade BT crops that has been released way back controls for lepidopteran pests and has been adopted very widely. Nowadays, there's even double, triple, and multi-stack uh, BT corn and BT cotton. Given the popularity of, of this GM crop, there's a lot of studies that look at, well, does this increase yield? Does this reduce insecticide use and so forth? And the, in the general consensus in the lit literature is that there is indeed a yield increasing effect and insecticide reducing effect for, for BT, which is somewhat expected. However, in terms of risk, production risk in particular for this uh, technology, there's been mixed evidence. Okay? Uh, Shankar et al. 2007, for example, found a risk increasing effect for BT. Okay? Cross and Shankar found a risk, well, I guess it's mixed evidence for panel data for BT cotton, for example. Now most of these studies that look at risk effects or production risk effects of BT crops, or BT cotton here in particular, um, only focus on BT cotton. Okay. So what do we want to address in this, in this study? There's two main gaps in the literature that we want to focus on. First, no study has looked at the risk effects of BT corn in a developing country context. Okay. Previous studies, as I've said, focused mainly on BT cotton, which is fundamentally different from, from, from BT corn. Uh, and there has been studies in both developed and developing country for uh, BT cotton. However, for BT corn, there's only one study that I know of, uh, like Hurley and Paul Mitchell, in the US. And I haven't found any that looked at production risk effects in a developing country context. So that's one area where we want to um, try to inform uh, the literature in terms of the risk effects of Second, we haven't found any, any study that looked look at downside risk effects. When we talk about risk, typically what people think about is, is variance. Okay? They look at mean variance, increasing variance, increasing risk. Uh, reduced variance, lower risk. But variance bo goes both ways, right? There's upside risk, there's downside risk. Farmers like upside risk, they don't like downside risk. So downside risk is, is another subtle aspect that hasn't been looked at in the literature so far. Okay? And this is typically looked at by looking at the skewness of the yield distribution or the, the production function. Higher skewness means lower downside risk. And farmers that are risk averse, uh, specific, specifically with decreasing absolute risk aversion, I'm not going to uh, define <laughs> and go into detail, but farmers who are averse to risk, which is fairly reasonable assumption, uh, tend to be averse to downside risk. They don't like higher probabilities 
loss, right? So you would like upside risk, but you don't like downside risk. So variance and downside risk effects are two separate things that has to be looked at separately. Okay? And by the way, if you have any questions, you know, just you raise your hand. We just have the question and answer. Okay, all right, so let's just wait till the end. Okay, so the objective then is really to look at just the production risk effects of BT core in the filters. And essentially, our approach is to look at the effect of this technology on the mean, the variance, and skewness of yields. And we do this using a what they call a stochastic production function uh, approach. Uh, and what we use is a non damage abatement and a damage abatement specification. Now, insecticides, or BT for example, are called damage abating inputs. In contrast to fertilizers, which is typically a yield enhancing input. Okay? I guess in the 1970s and so forth, they don't recognize the difference between those two inputs. Uh, in essence, yield enhancing inputs enhance yield like fertilizer, but damage abating inputs sort of prevents damage. So when you're structuring your model, it's better to recognize the difference of, of those two inputs. Okay? So in the 1980s, they came up with a damage abatement specification that allows one to delineate between damage abating and non-damage abating inputs. So look at two specifications in terms of that. And then from, from these effects, you could then use those mean uh, very skewness effects and then look at some risk-based welfare measures uh, like risk premium and certainty equivalence. Okay? And these two welfare measures typically um, gives an idea whether farmers are quote unquote better off with a certain technology, with a certain risky technology or not. Okay? Okay, so just some concepts first before we go forward. And I know this is sort of boring, but we need to, <laughs> to understand some of where I'm, I'm, I'm coming from. Now, the welfare measures I'm talking about okay, is basically grounded on expected utility theory. Okay? So, expected utility of profits, pi, could essentially be defined as expected utility of price, output price P, a stochastic production function G, X sub V, where X are the inputs, so C is the cost, so this is just revenue less cost. And then work by Arrow and Pratt suggests that expected utility of a random income, this is random income or random profit because of the uncertain variable V. Expected utility of a random profit is equal to the utility of an expected profit less R. Okay? R is the one welfare measure that we're interested in. Okay? And you can just think of R as just like premiums for when you have insurance. Right? Uh, so risk premium is, is essentially just the willingness to pay for a scheme that would eliminate risk exposure from and certain variable V by replacing the random net income pi or, or profit pi with it, its expected value. Okay? So expected utility of a random, random profit should equal to the utility of a certain income less some risk premium. Now, in, just in terms of understanding, um, the higher the risk premium, the more risk. So it's bad. You don't like risk, right? So that's the idea. So in terms of the welfare measure, we want lower risk for the technology. Okay. Now, the next thing to look at here is this term in the brackets. Expected profit minus R is essentially what we call the certainty equivalent. Okay. 
So the certainty equivalent sort of combines then the mean expected profit effect less the risk. So you could define certainty equivalent as the sure amount of net income that the farmer would be willing to receive that would give the same utility as the expected value of the random profit. Okay? So in this case, a higher CB means you have higher welfare. So you like a higher uh, certainty equivalent. Okay? That's what we want to look at. Now, one thing that's uh, oh, one other thing. Now, R is typically greater than zero to reflect risk aversion. So, a positive R means you're willing to pay some positive amount to reduce the risk. There is some amount that uh, you would be willing to pay to eliminate the risk and just get uh, a sure amount of income. So, given those two concepts, we would know if farmers are quote unquote better off with BT corn depending on its effect on R and CE. And from the literature, it can be shown that R can be approximated as follows, where okay, R2, R3 is just coefficient of absolute risk aversion coefficient of absolute prudence. We could just assume that. Typically, farmers are risk averse. Uh, this is just positive and negative. And given, given this formulation, M is just moments of the profit distribution. Okay? So M2 is just the second moment, meaning the variance. M3 is the third moment, meaning skewness. So this will allow us to look at the, the separate effects of variance and uh, skewness, okay? So that's where we want to get at. So if there's no skewness effect, everything will depend on, on the variance, okay? Now, how do we link that back to uh, sort of a production function uh, thinking? Assuming P is fixed and the cost is deterministic, all the moments of the profit distribution will really depend on just G. Okay. So the key to understanding how BT affects risk, risk in terms of variance and skewness, is being able to estimate the stochastic production function and its effect of BT on the second and third moment of this distribution, of this stochastic production function. That's just what I said, I think. So uh, we want to find a way to empirically estimate this stochastic production function and find the effect of BT on the mean, the skewness, the variance of the mean, and, and the skewness. Okay. okay, so given that that's sort of the, the, the main empirical approach for us to understand the the risk effects of BT, how do we do it? And there's two specifications. One is the what I call the DeFalco and Chavas model, uh, which is essentially just an expanded just hope production function. I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with this, but this is sort of a classic production function developed in the late 70s that uh, allows one to look at the mean and the variance effect. Okay? But Saha and Jean-Paul Chavas at Wisconsin sort of extended that traditional approach to include skewness. Okay? So that's one approach that we sort of looked at in this particular paper. Um, the problem with this uh, Ivanko and Chavas model is that doesn't account for the damage abating nature of insecticides and BT. Okay. Now, Saha developed a damage abatement specification 
uh, but it only accounted for uh, mean and variance. Okay, and so we, uh, Santi, my grad student in particular, extended that Saha model to allow for skewness effects, at the, and at the same time account for the damage of nature of insecticides and Bt. Okay. So those are the two specifications and, that we want to, to look at. Now, this is messy and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but this is how it looked like. And given this uh, default and survival specification, you have the three moments that you can estimate the mean, variance, skewness. Stop. Saha is the same thing, this is sort of its specification, where Fxp is the yield enhancing inputs and H is the damage abating inputs so we allow for two, two separate specifications for the damage abating versus the uh, yield enhancing inputs and under the specification this will be log normal you can prove that and I'm not going to show that here but again given the log normality we could come up with the moment conditions that are estimated. Okay? And I'm not going to go through in the details of this because it will take us forever. Okay. Some of the practical stuff then. Data. We used two farm level data sets uh, in 0304 and 0708. Uh, 0304, I think, is the first year of availability of BT corn uh, in the Philippines. So this is the ISA survey. Uh, and we collected data from Isabella, Cameron Sur, we could not have the about. The second year is the if it's an IFPRI survey that only focused on Isabella and South Cotabato. And we essentially used stratified random sampling. We chose the provinces, then we chose the barangays within the provinces with high density. Uh, of higher density of BT uh, adopters and then based on that using the list of BT adopters in those selected areas we just randomly sampled from that list and then we chose selected uh, barangays in the vicinity or neighboring uh, uh, barangays so that you know the social de uh, de demographic areas the climate you know so forth are, are similar and then from the non-BT List from I think the uh, municipality where we got the non DT list from the Brangai itself. We randomly sampled the non DT growers as well. Estimation and I'm not gonna delve into details. The Falco and Chavas estimated by non linear least squares, extended Saha given the log normality, maximum likelihood. It's an easy way to estimate the model. AIC, VIC specification tests were used to determine best fitting function forms. Um, typically, I think we used Cobb Douglas on the mean and the variance, and, and in the skewness, we used a, a linear function. And in terms of the actual empirical specification, um, we use a sort of a parsimonious production function specification, so it's just yield as a function of seed, insecticide use, fertilizer, and labor. So we didn't include um, a lot of other farm characteristics that, that might influence uh, yield, and I'll tell you how we dealt with that in a little bit. We also included, of course, a binary BT adoption variable allow for looking at the difference uh, in terms of the risk effects between BT and BT. Now, one issue given this parsimonious specification is selection problems due to non-random selection of BT farmers. Now, even though we randomly sampled and so forth, um, the adoption of BT is not random. Okay? Farmers voluntarily by BT. It's sort of a self-selected sample. Okay? 
So it could be, for example, that farmers who adopted BT are typically the ones that are more educated. So, so the problem, if you don't control, control for these selection problems, is that if you observe a difference between the BT and non-BT, it could be that the difference was due to, say, education, farming experience, and not due to BT itself. So you're misattributing the effect of BT on the stuff. Okay? Now, one simple approach to control for that is just plug it in the specification. Okay? So in addition to the input, add education, add all this stuff. The problem is given, as you saw the equations, it's, it's hard to converge with all these other uh, uh, non-input variables. Okay? So one way to take care of this is what we call oops, propensity score matching. Okay? So the idea with propensity score matching is essentially try to find within your sample, find non-BT farmers that are as similar as possible to the BT farmers that you have. Okay? And there's a lot of details with this, but this will allow for controlling such observable characteristics like education, distance to seed suppliers, um, what location dummies, and so forth. Okay, so this will clean out those say farm characteristics that may influence yield, uh, but we cannot include in the uh, stochastic production function specifically. So in the language of, of this literature, you want to find valid counterfactuals, so comparable matching non-BT farmers that is as similar as possible. Okay? And I, I'll talk about this in a little bit, some more about this. Okay, we did selection and endogeneity tests on the match sam sa sample so that we are sure also that there's no selection bias. That thing that I talked to you about, that maybe we're misattributing uh, the BT effect to something else. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you could see this uh, clearly, but this is just uh, some descriptive statistics for for the data we have for the um, production function. So as you could see, for the full sample in 0304, yields are typically higher. Mean yields for BT compared to non-BT, but for, say, standard deviation, for example, in 0304, <coughs> BT has higher standard deviation, okay? while in 0708, it's very close. <coughs> so, based on this, you could probably say, well, it's variance increasing, right? But, as I've said, this is just a descriptive thing. It could be due to some, something else. So that's why we go to that modeling exercise. Okay, before going to the estimation, I also typically look at the data itself and see how, how it looks. So for, this is just a kernel density estimates for, for uh, BT and non-BT for both years. So if you look at, this is 0304, this is 0708. If you look, there's a clear positive mean yield effect, right? So there's a shift to the right for the BT farmers compared to the non-BT farmers. But just a foreshadowing a little bit, if you look at the shape of these two curves, not a whole lot of difference. So that gives you some idea as to what we should find in terms of the variance and skewness effect. There's no big difference in terms of the shape of the two distributions. Okay, now, one other quick and dirty sort of uh, way to look at two risky alternatives is what we call stochastic dominance techniques. Okay? This is just a non-parametric technique to look at CDFs of, or cumulative distribution functions of risky alter alternatives and to just determine which is uh, which technology is preferred, so to speak? Okay, 
purely based on CDFs. And first degree stochastic dominance is one criteria to look at and determine whether one, te one risky technology is preferred over the other. Now, here, in first degree stochastic dominance, it should be that the CDFs should not cross. If the CDF of B, the BT is all to the uh, right of non-BT, then the BT technology is preferred. If it crosses, then you have to use second degree stochastic dominance, and there's an additional assumption for second degree, it's just risk aversion, but that's a fairly, fairly um, reasonable behavioral assumption. And this is how it looks like the CDS, and as you can see, most the BT curves almost always at the to the right of non-BT, but there are crossing points in the tails, so we really can't use first degree stochastic dominance. But based on second degree stochastic dominance, BT is still preferred. Okay. Now, again, as I said, this is sort of a quick and dirty way of looking at two technologies, okay, whatever technologies there is. Okay. The problem with this technique is that you do not control for other observables, like the inputs per se. It could be that the difference in CDF may be just BT farmers use more fertilizer, something like that. Okay. Or it could be that BT farmers are more, you know, uh, more experienced, better at managing the crop, and so forth. And that's why we, we will go through that process of going through the stochastic production function approach and propensity score matching to uh, allow for uh, controlling non-input variables that affect uh, outcomes, and then, of course, in input variables that affect outcomes. So we estimated these things. Oh, OK, sorry, the match data that came about through propensity score matching is, in, in the end, we ended up with 91 BT non-BT, and then 147 BT non-BT. So these are the match farmers that as, as similar as possible. Okay. Now, the way to do the matching is essentially look at, do a, a first stage logit. And as you can see here, the one thing to notice is that there are significant variables that determine whether or not farmers adopt BT. The dependent variable here is BT adoption. Okay, BT is equal to one, uh, meaning BT, uh, farmers adopt BT zero, non-BT. So in this case, if, if we didn't control using propensity score matching, education, for example, was significant in 03, 04. Again, we could, we could have been misattributing the effect of BT on uh, we, BT, but it should be due to education, something like that. Okay. Uh, so we did this approach to clean, clean up and do the propensity score matching. And then you can see the effect here. With the unmatched data, you see there's significant differences between the BT and non-BT. So education is different, uh, whether or not they have access to electricity, um, farming experience. But when we use the match sample, they are not significant. So all the p-values here is insignificant, meaning the non-farm characteristics of our match sample are similar statistically already. Okay? Meaning they are comparable and any difference, there's no, uh, there's no, uh, we won't misattribute the effect of BT on these things because they are already essentially statistically the same when we do the match. Okay? These are the parameter estimates. Uh, I'm just going to breeze through it because it's hard to inter inter uh, interpret, but got, this is the parameter estimates for the Saha. This is where we want to look at. <laughs> Marginal effects of the BT. Okay? So this is the main point that we want to make in this uh, paper. So, first is the mean effects, okay? So, as you can see here for 03, 04, for 07, 08, for the default, 
and even for the Saha model, all statistically significant mean increasing effect, which is fairly consistent with the literature uh, on BT crops. Okay? So there is a mean increasing effect. So there's no, there's overwhelming evidence in, in, based on our data for the mean effect. Now, for the variance and skewness effect, there's not a whole lot of evidence of any risk in terms of variance and skewness effect. So, for example, here in, in using the DeFalco and Chavaz specification, everything is insignificant. And the variance effects is negative, which is fairly uh, what's, what, what we expect, reduces variance. But skewness is uh, negative which is not what we expect. We want uh, downside risk reduction is a positive skewness effect. But in the Saha model, for 07, 08, there, again, there's no effect. But the only exception here is the 03, 04, where we found some significant effect in terms of the variance, variance increasing, but skewness increasing or downside risk reducing uh, effect. Okay, so based on this model, there is a variance increasing effect, which is what we don't want, but there is a skewness increasing, which is downside risk reducing, which is what we want. So uh, it could balance out in the end, which we'll see in, in the next slide. So main point is, is that mean effects, there's no doubt in my mind, okay? There's empirical evidence here to show that there is a mean yield increase, strong mean yield increasing effect. Variance, there is no overwhelming evidence of production risk effects of BT crop. Okay. Now going back, as I said, when we first started, we want to look at the welfare measures, risk premiums, and certainty equivalents. For 0304 in the Defalco and Chavas, the risk premium is there's a reduction here. 0708, there's a reduction in risk as well. And the CE, certainty equivalent, is positive, increasing for uh, BT, and it's statistically significant for. 0304, but not in 0708. Okay, it's the same thing with with the Saha model, except that the risk effects here is, is sort of the other way around. And this is due to that variance increasing effect. But even with this risk increasing effect for the Saha model, given the dominant mean yield effect, the certainty equivalence is still bigger for uh, the BT part. So, point is, uh, farmers are still better off with BT because of that mean yield increasing effect, even if uh, there could be some risk, risk increasing effects uh, that we incorporate. Okay, so that's that's the main point here. Now, one last thing that we looked at is it, sort of the probability of loss in terms of the profit because that's sort of the bottom line that we want to look at. Will the probability of loss be lower for BT corn compared to non-BT corn? Okay. And what we are finding is that yes, there is some evidence. If you draw a line straight up here in the zeros, so negative means negative profits, right? You don't like that. The probabilities are lower for BT, right? Here for the default range of loss, and for Saha, it's the same thing here. Except this is the only exception in 07, 08 that uh, there's no significant difference between the probability of loss for BT and non BT. So there is a little bit of evidence in terms of uh, 
risk-reducing effect in terms of lower probability of loss for BT. But again, it's no not overwhelming evidence given this exception. Okay, so what have we found in essence? Medial increasing effect is, I think, the dominant effect for BT core in the Philippines. Generally, there's no statistically significant variance and skewness effects. So to me, that means there's no overwhelming evidence to suggest that BT core reduces production risk in terms of variance reduction and downside risk reduction. So there's, I think there's lots of people that claim that BT corn also reduces risk, but our evidence suggests that it's not there. Okay. Well, there's not an overwhelming support for it. So that's the gist of this. And when, when I talked to some colleagues in, in the U.S., and they were not surprised, actually. Okay? For example, in the U.S., there's crop insurance for BT corn, and typically they give discounts to those who adopt BT corn that are triple stacks. Okay? Triple stack meaning it has Roundup has that uh, control for lepidopter and pest plus corn rootworm. And to them, they say, just in the U.S., the corn rootworm, the triple, that triple stack is the one that causes uh, risk reduction. Okay? And they looked at farm trials and so forth, and that's what they found. And in, in crop insurance, for example, in the U.S., single stack or double stack BT do not qualify for uh, the crop insurance risk premium reduction. Okay? So, this is not, given that talk, I was not surprised actually that we didn't find overwhelming evidence of production risk effects of, of BT corn here in, in the Philippines. But as I said, there are some exceptions that we, we found some uh, skewness increasing effect in the Saha model in 0304, and we, we posit that this may. Our sample included traditional varieties plus hybrids. In 07, 08, it's more hybrids and BT. So we found some evidence of this, but maybe it's just due to our counterfactual uh, non-BT growers, including uh, traditional varieties. So there is some evidence, but again, no, not overwhelming in my opinion. Certain equivalent welfare measures still suggest BT corn farmers are better off than their non BT counterpart, and that is mainly due to the mean yield increasing effects. Okay? And, and so, not the risk effects. Although some of the simulated profit distribution provides some evidence that there's lower probability of negative profits when you use BT, which is, again, there's some value to that. But there is some exception in 0708, for example. Now, some future work, uh, we wanted to collect uh, panel data, maybe use pseudo-panel techniques to just make it tease out the effect a little bit better. Panel data is when you have repeated sampling of observations over time. So you could, you could have that time dimension to look at the risk over time as well. So, uh, as I said, in, in, in the U.S., a lot of folks, those that, that developed the uh, discounts for crop insurance looked at long-term farm trials for, for their discounts at various locations. And I don't know if we have that kind of data here uh, for, for BT corn. Maybe look at multi-trade if uh, triple stacks or more if there is uh, it has been released here. And then use other downside risk uh, methods like lower partial moments for looking at the risk effects as well. And that's all I have. So thank you.
Todd. Hey. Yes, Todd. Joseph Pollock. Visiting here in ELP. Um, so is, is there any evidence of uh, input substitution? I, I have a 10th grader's understanding of, uh, of the science. But I, my understanding is that the, the BT technology um, reduces probability of the, le the left tail in yields. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the, the alternative is use a traditional or hybrid seeds and spray when you see the pest. Yeah. Right? So and there's substitution between insecticide use and, and BT. The, that's right. And so in that sense, if you're just switching inputs, right, you might not see an effect in the distribution of the yields, but it, you're just using different inputs. Well, it's not exactly apples and apples, because the problem with spraying is if you have rains or whatever, it washes off some of the insecticides, and the efficacy of insecticides is not as good as if it were BT, because it doesn't wash it off. So it's not a perfect substitute given the random weather events. And we actually have another paper that shows in bad weather, the damage abating effect of BT is more pronounced compared to quote unquote a normal weather year. So there's some, there's not apples to apples substitution. Other comments or questions or suggestions? Okay, uh, you said that the tree is stuck. You're not sure if there is a tree. The tree in one gene mm -hmm. of uh, corn here in the village. Yeah, there is a lot. Okay. Especially in Isabella. Because we are having a project right now on the tree in one and the stuck with PT. Is the root worm is the third component? No. It's What's the, the, the first one is the BT for the corn borer, the second one is the RR. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the tick to it one only. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. So that's, RR that, and, yeah. yeah, so. Yeah. We don't have the tick, sorry. Yeah. And then you said that, uh, my question is, you said that the cream stock causes uh, a little, uh, there is a risk reduction. And I, uh, I want to know what are the reasons well, our agronomy friends say that the triple stack in the U.S. includes control for the, the corn borer, Roundup, and the third component is for corn rootworm. And the corn rootworm is, I think, in the roots. And so the, what my agronomy friends have said is that, and this is also seen in one of the National Academy of Science publications recently, in the U.S. is that the corn rootworm control allows for better root density. Again, I'm not an agronomist, but that's how they explain it to me. And so given the better root densities of the corn crop, it weathers, you know, bad events, droughts, and all those stuff better. And that's the thing that causes the risk reduction over, you know, random weather or random environments and so forth. So that is my understanding of why in the US, for example, crop insurance premiums for BT farmers only applies for triple stack BT growers. Double stack, single stack growers do not qualify for uh, risk, the premium reduction in their crop insurance premiums because of that. That's my understanding. Again, I'm not an agronomist. <laughs>